so much, everyone. I am so excited. Welcome to another incredible conversation during um, this first year of our Transformational Life series. All of you who have been watching and listening, um, you will have had some incredible conversations um, being heard and you will have seen these. You will have gotten um, to hear and listen to some amazing inspirational life stories and I am so excited to share another one with each of you now. Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Everyone, Josh is an incredible person, an amazing man, amazing soul. And without further ado, because you know, you will have gotten to grips with how these things work. You're gonna learn more about Josh very soon. Um, what I will do to begin this is ask you, Josh, would you like to briefly introduce yourself to everyone? For sure. Hi, my name is Josh, and thank you so much, Krista, for having me on this series. Um, I hope that um, I hope that the people that are doing these interviews and the people that are watching it ends up being transformative for everybody, just in itself. You know, um, just to go along with, I'm going to talk about my transformations, but I hope that there is a transformative effect that happens just from people doing this filming. Um, yeah, my name is Josh, and I am a person who focuses on transformation actually as like a really big part of my life. And what I mean to say is that um, a lot of the things that I've learned are about having a dynamic and flexible mind and a dynamic and flexible energy field. Uh, it's not always pleasant. There are times where the growth happens or the transformations happen because there's a pressure being applied. Um, uh, something doesn't feel quite right and we have to keep going with it. But at the same time, learning how to have an attitude of openness, I guess you could say, and being able to transform and to be able to... Uh, change but i don't mean change in like yeah it's kind of a weird one but change change depending on what is suitable to our evolution and suitable to uh to the changes and progressive of our society um that's a big part of my life and so i host meditation classes based on that so we get into a very dynamic and open spot within ourselves not identified with our idea about ourselves but identified uh with anything not identified with anything at all and being that open awareness. So that's what I do. And also holding space for people doing, during healing sessions for transformation and to go through healing in that same fashion. Awesome, amazing. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, so Josh, today, and everyone watching and listening, obviously we are here to learn more about you, more about your life story thus far, um, knowing you know, for each of us, all of our journeys we are continuing every day to grow and evolve um today we're speaking with you josh and you know a great place to start for a lot of us <laughs> when we look at your life journey so far is at the beginning so some of your early years early experiences when you think about that what are some of the things that come to you who was josh well it's interesting when you say that um I have a funny process. I almost never think about myself. So I don't think about what I was in the past. And it's not like a, uh, there's no real reason for me not to. I just almost never do. But when you just said that, I imagined myself as a little boy and I could see me being a very sensitive little boy. I was always that. And a very curious little boy. I was definitely one of the, the why, 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 why kids. And they used to drive my parents completely insane. Um, and that same drive, I guess you could say, of asking why has also been the same force that's led to the decision or the intention to, to be a transformational person. Uh, the question of why and not allowing for the answer to really settle in <laughs> without keep on, keep on asking why has been the very fuel to keep going. Um, I grew up in the Annapolis Valley here in Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, which is a very rural spot. My dad was a farmer and and my mom was a homemaker growing up. Like it was a very humble beginning. And um, i trying to think of what else I could say about myself at that time, you know? Again, just very curious, happy childhood. I did have a happy childhood for, you know, all families have their little the little misgivings and all the, the pain that we go through. But uh, but in general, it's very safe and very very lucky in that way. Uh, especially getting to know how much pain is in the world. I feel very, very blessed and uh, appreciate very much the upbringing that I had. Um, but yeah, I don't really know what else to say about my actual childhood, but that's just because, again, I almost never think of it. Like, I'm not the kind of person who has a diary that's like, 
yesterday I did this and then, and then I did this and then I just don't even think about it at all. Like I'm just like, well, whatever's going on is going on. <laughs> and also <laughs> there's been a few pretty drastic transformations and we're going to talk about those where my whole structure of personality has been through transformations. And so whenever that happens, it's not that, it's not that I don't like completely Dis uh, vow. I'm not like, oh, that part didn't happen. I just, it just doesn't come naturally to think about, right? So it's just an interesting, uh, interesting question. You've certainly got me uh, in an interesting state, even leading up to this, thinking like, what the fuck am I going to say about that kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Which is, you know, it begets a really great question. If you do tend to live in a, a sort of non-linear way, or um, uh, you know, kind of go moment to moment. For me, I began to think, okay, well, what led up to that then? You know, because you you shared earlier that you uh, were a very curious child. You know, really curious about the world, really interested in transformation. What for you do you feel like was some of the um, the the reasoning, or and or why did it feel important to you to focus on transformation? Okay. Being a fairly intuitive child as well, in other words, psychically aware, which I think every child is, um, mm. there was also a real sense that something was amiss at times in our culture. Mm. I noticed that almost everybody was lying all the time. There was that. And I don't mm. mean lying and like uh, blatantly lying, but I mean, if mm. you say, uh, how are you? And the person goes, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, there is like that. You know, like there is, <laughs> so as a child, I was always like, um, I always grew up with the sense that something was a bit amiss. And I think that's what the desire for transformation led to. There was a feeling of, you know, I always, one of my least favorite experiences growing up, and it happens so often, is when you were in a store, let's say, and people were just being really, really mean to each other. And you could tell it was like a customer was yelling at a cashier or a, a boss was upset with an employee or whatever. There was just this weird chain of things that I always observed growing up. And it was always quite disturbing to me, to be honest. And uh, I'd say that the biggest fuel, I remember going through, like, we'll talk about the big, big change happened when I was 19 and going like up until that point, there was a feeling of like, there's something more to reality that we're missing. And then when it actually started to reveal itself over the period of like 19 to 24, there was some pretty big shifts and bumps as it started to reveal that there is more to reality. In fact, our, we're living in a matrix basically, you know, like I think everyone, everyone pretty much knows that that's the case. It's not a, a solid static reality, but geez, it sure presented as that growing up, you know, growing up, it always mm -hmm. seemed like we were in this really solid static reality and that people were, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a farmer. That's all I am. That's all I'll ever be kind of thing. Like there's, there was this weird inauthenticity, I guess you could say to the way that people became the roles and the scripts in their minds and then were, mean to each other in those scripts too i'm like wow that's a pretty poor story we're telling <laughs> did he play <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely. Up, there was always a keen sense about that that was something that was always um you know i don't identify with anything but the idea of indigo child or whatever i think there was an element of that um mm -hmm. but i don't identify as that i just think that there was something about having an open third eye but in a very strange place in a very strange system that's always been the case I love all of this. Thank you so much. You know, and it, I'm realizing as well, there may be some people watching and listening where some of this might be new yeah. information for them as well. So if we could back up just a little bit, if you don't mind, just to kind of clarify things for people, just in case they, they are having questions with some of what we're discussing. Um, if we start with the idea of matrix, Right, I yeah. know what you mean, say that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, you know, it's a good starting point. So if, how yeah. would you describe the matrix to someone if they're unfamiliar yeah. with what that's about? Yeah, there's a couple of different angles to go at that from, but um, even in, let's say, I remember traveling in India and I was talking with a Baba, so a holy man, and he was like, life is movie and humans are producers. Like he was trying to find a way to say that we're in a, we're in a, Okay, if you're not aware that you're in a play, but we're still in a play, that's what's going on. So in other words, like, um, we all think that we are our characters, basically, right? Our characters within a play. 
And when we identify as that, then we're kind of in the matrix, like we're in a play and we're a character in a play, but ultimately our souls are, are not that, you know? And so the movie, The Matrix, when Neo realizes, holy crap, and he pops out of it and he's able to see that he's not just a person in, in a world, but actually there's a whole th- sort of like fabric in behind the whole thing. That is true for our reality as well, um, in my experience. And recognizing that we are in this matrix or whatever, I don't like, I don't even call it that normally. It's just, it just seems like an easy way to talk about it. Mm. Um, recognizing that we're in it, then we actually have a bit of uh, consciousness or presence that can come into it. And we're not just running the scripts that we were taught either through generational and familial upbringing or cultural upbringing, or from the scripts that we have written ourselves um, that we take very, very seriously, especially if we write them again uh, when we're young and we're looking for safety and security and all that kind of stuff, which is what we're all looking for to some extent. Um, it's really easy to get into the script of the character and to only, to not be able to break that. You know what I mean? Like, don't get me wrong. It's nice to have a little character. It's nice to have a little script, but not being able to break that means we get stuck in a so- solid um, solid mindset and then we're locked into the play so again in in hinduism uh, i'm not hindu but in hinduism they talk about the atman being the the source if you will the the one god creative force and behind it all and that we're all part of this play and when a person realizes that they're not just their character but they're actually connected to the whole then they realize the atman within themselves so this is that's just the um, the hindu way to, to say that whole thing but every uh, every religion and every uh, culture and every everyone has their own sort of story as to how that comes about. And in North America and in the Western world in particular, we're lacking that story uh, because we've been so indoctrinated really into that script for so long, you know, like that's industrial complex. Um, I'm going to say colonialization as well. Like we're, we're really in a script and it's hard to break from that when your friends and family are all doing that, you know? So that's how I would, yeah. I, it's kind of a roundabout way to describe that, sorry, but the idea of, yeah. of us being in a matrix is like us being in a play. If you watch the matrix, it seems like everyone's in a play. Now, are we actually in a computer simulation? I'm not sure. There's lots of, even Elon Musk keeps talking about that. There seems to be some sort of case for this being a, a simulation, but taking it out of that very literal form and making it more of a metaphor, the matrix is the scripted reality that we're living in. I love that you brought up Elon Musk. Um, that's not related to what we're discussing today, but Elon Musk, I'll just share, keeps coming up for me again and again and again. And that's another thing people may be interested. This is like a side point, and then we'll get back to what we were discussing. If you're meant to have your attention brought to something, often you can keep coming across it in different ways. So sure. this is just one example of that. But anyway, yeah. let's get yeah. back. Elon Musk is, is, is the white rabbit in the situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will talk more about that with you later. But <laughs> for today, so. Um, okay, so that was amazing. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. And another way, and I, I um, was curious if this also would resonate with the, for you with the idea of the matrix. Another way people could also relate to what you were sharing is that if you um, if you think about even the basic concept of reincarnation, and think about the idea that you know we're one soul but we keep having different lives, that also ties into this, and that each life is you know you could say it's like the matrix, or as Shakespeare said, we are all but players upon a stage. So and, in every and, life, and hmm. when, as a person who has done quite a bit of past life work, in other words, I've experienced and explored that type of thing. Um, I feel like this is a really neat opportunity in this life to break those scripts from past lives as well. You know, the idea is to come into presence or consciousness or openness or whatever and do that work to, because I know that there are certain conditionings that I grew up with that when I did some work and, and looked into it, it did come from, from past life conditioning as well as cultural, as well as familial and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if we go on really quickly to the next term you mentioned, in case people are wondering, um, the next thing you mentioned that people might be curious about is the idea of the indigo child. Now, again, yeah. I know what you're referring to, but that might be new for some people. So how would you describe that? that? There's actually really important teachings that say that when we call children indigo children, we're actually doing them a disservice because we're giving them an identity that they might uh, identify with and not actually be, they might re-script that. 
and then not be in their openness, okay? So I just want to give that as a clarifier. I'm not a person who's pushing any particular ideologies. Um, but the idea is that there is a shift in global consciousness that's happening. And a part of that is that a lot of people have been incarnated, which have opened third eyes. So indigo is on the chakra spectrum is this color of the third eye. And again, I would argue that everybody in their truest form already is open that way. So it's not necessarily a special thing. However, there does seem to be an awful lot of people that came in around this time period all at once that had that openness to be able to see through scripts, to be able to have deep intuition. There's just, again, um, as a person who's studied a lot of um, Buddhism and, and that sort of training, it's important not to identify with those things because I have met people who have almost been disserviced by being labeled children by their parents, okay? So I just want to say that there seems to be people that are more tapped in, I guess you could say, to these realms of consciousness, and we could call them indigo people, but it's better not to call anybody anything and just to allow people to keep doing their doing their thing. I love that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And And I'm curious with all of that, how important has it been for you to be able to break free from labels? Do you, because you mentioned, um, that you know you've come across quite a few people who for them it's been very important not to be necessarily categorized in one way Especially and Especially yeah 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 is that something you've come across in your journey yeah, at all certainly i mean even being even being called a man really is a disservice mm -hmm. you know i i don't identify mm -hmm. as being a human being even necessarily now don't get me wrong humanistic qualities of openness and empathy and love are super important. Um, but I think that if we identify with a certain characteristic within ourselves, or we identify with, um, with being anything other than just being, then that would be the opposite, at least of meditation, right? So I've done a lot of work to decondition any sort of identities or labels that, uh, that, are, that are on me. At the same time, I also notice that there is a push sometimes for identity uh, in our culture, and that maybe that's an okay thing too, because sometimes we have to have a foot in our identity in order to be able to transcend it in a healthy way. In other words, if you don't, if you're in shaky foundation and then transcend into this openness, it might not be healthy because we don't know who the fuck we are. You know, it could be that having a yeah. solid identity and then being able to overcome it, which is a psychological understanding as well. You're meant to have a healthy ego before we can transcend that ego, rather than trying to jump the process. So for me, though, in my life, whenever I've identified too strongly with anything, and I mean anything, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like then my perception is routinized into seeing things from that filter, which is okay, but then it will block out other, other perceptions. So I prefer to rest in neutrality or openness and be able to see things from multiple perspectives. Um, and if I identify with anything, again, like even being a, a man, then I'm going to see things through that filter. That, and I have done that before. See through the things through that filter, but then I'm omitting, I guess you could say, things from, from other perspectives. So I, I, <laughs> a big part of my life and, and what makes me feel right, I guess, within myself is not to identify with any particular role or um or not to identify as one part of a whole uh, and rather try to keep open to the bigger picture within myself i love that i love that where do you think that importance that you just mentioned so the importance of being able to you know not root yourself in any one uh way of living or seeing the world necessarily but to be open to whatever experience has uh, to hold for you, where do you think that desire within yourself stems from? Well, you know, again, if we're going to talk in spiritual language, it must be a past life thing. I feel like I've trained in that sort of arts in different Asian past life, for example. I feel like um, that's been a big part of, of Taoistic tradition. So I feel like I have a, a rooting in that. Um, but in this lifetime, it's just it's just the experience of life. When I'm when I observe myself identifying with something and then pushing it forward and realizing the blind spots that it creates and realizing the lack of openness that I have towards other people and things. I just don't want to do that. So for mm. me, I don't think it's necessarily um, 
one source or one cause, but it's just that if I actually am aware in my life, I can see the the potential negativity that it causes. Uh, Krishnamurti, if you know who he is, um, is um, a I think so. Indian philosopher. I'm not again. I don't I don't follow any teachers necessarily, but one thing he said was that by proclaiming even that you are a Christian or a Hindu or anything by saying mm. I am a uh, and then inserting something, it is an act of violence to some extent because it mm. means that we're separating ourselves from other people. And uh, the stronger the identity, yeah, the more separation we're putting between ourselves and other identities, right? So mm. that's just that's just the way that um, I've studied and trained, I suppose, right? I don't know. Mm. But again, yeah, if I just I look it just very directly, if I do that, it creates a separation, which will create a certain uh, either drama or a lack of understanding or a filtering. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> mm. So would you rather be, would an, um, an additional thought to that, would it also perhaps be that you would rather be connected? Sure. Yeah. 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 Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we all, you'd think, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Now backing, switching gears a little bit, but also backing up a little bit. Um, you mentioned earlier um, a couple times in your life, in your life journey thus far, that really helped to shape things for you and were very transformative. And one of them you mentioned is being when you were 19. Would yeah. that experience have been another one that... Um, the result of it was you really uh, thinking differently, but also um, realizing that there was an opportunity to, to transform in a, in a deeper way. Yeah. Well, what happened was um, my dad went through a transformation and became a yoga teacher. And I was always, this is actually a big one. Is it, uh, sorry, um, my phone started ringing, it messed things up. Um, <laughs> big conversation that he and I had is that he's not my dad and I'm not his son. Although we are, of course, on one level, we started to break the scripting. So there was an unconscious compulsion, for example, for me to want to show off to my dad, you know, or to prove myself in some sense. And there was subconscious uh, I, things for him to be the leader in some way. We started to defrag and deprogram the scripts that we had together. And that was a really big thing. Honestly, it was a big thing. Powerful to do that with my father. Um, yeah. And at the same time, we were learning things like um, do you ever see the movie What the Bleep Do You Know Anyway? Uh, and and The Secret at the time, which is funny, that's it's kind of like faux pas to talk about The Secret, but this is when it first came out. <laughs> it was pretty big news. We were like, holy crap, like there's more to reality than we thought. And so, yeah. as a 19 year old, I'm 33 now, so 14 years ago, going through that transformation, starting to starting to tap into, those are very surface teachings at first, especially the secret, that was a very surface teaching, but it led to something more. It led to an understanding that I'm not the script uh, that, I, that I've that i been conditioned to be, um, but something else. And actually a part of that transformation, just breaking the script, I started to eat differently and I started to think differently about myself and I started to be more positive about about the way I thought about myself and my body went through a massive transformation so I lost a lot of weight mm. and I consider it emotional weight you know there's nothing mm. wrong nothing wrong with weight but I at the time mm. there was something that shifted I felt like I I lost a lot of my ideas about myself and my mm. physical body went through a transformation because of that um mm. so this is all when I was 19 yeah it was a big changing point and mm. when I remember I started to get visions of what my face was going to look like, and it looks quite a bit different than it did uh, now than it did then. And I remember seeing the vision, and then I'd look in the mirror and seeing the vision and look in the mirror, and I'd watch as I was transforming quite physically, actually, um, through that process. You know, we are made of vibration and atoms. Mm. We're not as solid as we think we are, but if we think we're solid, then we are. <laughs> that's, the, mm. that's kind of the trick, right? So mm. if if I think of myself as the way I look and the way I think and the way I am, and I really get solid about that, then it's almost like creating a cast over top of the energy body or the vibrational self, but freeing myself from a lot of those thought forms. I went through an amazing transformation at that time. Um, also learning how to, I'm going to say influence reality with my mind at that time as well. 
and was very, very focused on that for a number of years. Um, I'd like to lead that eventually into when I was 23 and realized that there are better things to do with one's time, but that that was a really, um, it, it was important to understand that we have that power. And then for me, as again, when I was 23, it was learning how to be more responsible with that power, let's just say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, growing up a little bit in ways as well, yeah. yeah. The thing is, is in most mystical traditions, you learned about those principles after the age of 40. And so mm. learning how to do alchemy or transform reality at the age of 19, uh, I still was a young hotshot, you know, hormonally <laughs> <laughs> and chemically driven <laughs> um, yeah. and wanted to be cool and wanted to be popular and wanted to be all those things, you know, that's, and there's nothing wrong with those things either, but the drive to use those um, mind influencing law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, things in order to to gain some sort of popularity was definitely something that I was doing and definitely a process of coming into my heart and and real present moment to overcome even some of those things later on. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I suppose we all need a gateway. You know, they, they talk about things like marijuana being a gateway drug. Well, sometimes you need a gateway to spirituality. <laughs> Marijuana actually had something to do with that as well. But, but, uh, I imagine things. a lot of people will, re will relate to that statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we, could, we could do a section in this talk about uh, my relationship to different psychedelics and stuff. I've had pretty extensive experience and, and don't really at all anymore, but that was a part of my, the big part of my life. Mm. Yeah, I relate to that. And I feel like as well for a lot of people that, and you know, you can let me know, um, if this if you connect with this as well but in my experience anyway those sorts of things they can be sort of a fundamental part of growing up okay. growing experience you know and some of the especially, things you do when you're younger and you're exploring well especially in a culture without rituals of coming into age you know we don't have mm. a lot of turning points in fact everything is quite routinized so that we go and we go to school and we get a job we that 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 there's not always a break from that pattern and mm. um, that when i was 19 i was actually going to be a computer programmer until that oh, point wow. and when i went through a big i we took school and everything and, and even worked out for a little while afterwards but that was a big shift to realize um that i didn't want to do those types of things i didn't want to follow the script and and marijuana was a part of that yeah but it was mm. I, I almost that almost dismisses or minimizes the rest of it, which was not just mm. marijuana. Right? That was a, a small mm. part of what's happening. And the understanding of scripting, the understanding of awareness of our mind and the way that it operates was absolutely first. And those other parts were just parts along the way. Mm. So did that happen, what you've just shared, um, you know, having even worked as a programmer and so on, and then realizing that it wasn't for you. Was that also around the age of 23 or was, or did that come later? Yeah, no, that was 1920. Yeah. That was like, that was, that was all like, I went to school at 18, 19, right. And broke, moved out on my own, realized the nature of reality and was like, fuck this and started to just do my own thing. <laughs> I worked at restaurants and stuff, but it became this joyous thing to connect with people on deeper and different levels and outside of scripts. Like that was the the main point of my life from that point forward and still is, you know, like uh, we don't, again, I'm not perfect. We all fall into different things. We all fall into different identities mm. and woundings and all these things, but mm. sitting with people in open space and being with people with that potential edge of transformation, I guess you could say, in other words, anything is possible is something that's a really important thing in my life and was from that point forward. Mm, I, okay, so a few things. I love what you've shared. And, and it feels like that idea of anything is possible. That feels very powerful. And also, um, I'm curious about, well, let's start with this. Why was that so important for you to know that anything is possible? Well, obviously, because the opposite was the case for a long time. I remember mm -hmm. looking at myself in the mirror as a teenager and thinking I was ugly, you know, as mm -hmm. looking at um, just really buying into my scripting and conditioning. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about this from a higher than thou place. Last week, I found something inside myself where I was like, shit, like that's a static point, you know, like <laughs> ongoing 
everlasting process, but that was a very, very large reality jump from one real total, I thought this is the way I was going to be forever into something totally different. And that was, uh, yeah. um, so this is just, we're just talking about bigger transformations, but transformations are also an ongoing process. And as I deal with my own wounding and the culture's wounding and the collective and stuff like where is the ongoing process mm, mm, absolutely i love that i love that you know and i can't help but think back as well to you know if we do look at it in sort of um you know everyday terms as well you have the spiritual importance of why anything is possible but even when you look at it in everyday terms i mean i remember and i'm i'm guessing you'll relate to this um I remember so many workplaces I've been in over the years, you know, along my path and where, you know, I encountered maybe someone who had been there a little bit too long, someone who had become a little bit <laughs> jaded and they had started to lose some of that belief that, you know, anything is possible. And then, you know, because if you don't believe that anything is possible, it's easier to become stuck. Absolutely. It's, I remember yeah. school, school teachers in particular that like hated kids, basically. I was like, wow kind of a weird profession choice <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's, that's a really that's good over, point <laughs> over, time, over time if you're doing the same thing over and over again you don't have that flexibility and openness within yourself to choose differently then yeah it does feel like a burden it feels like life itself was a burden and uh mm. although i was too young to become overly jaded that was mm. the the path that i could have head down you know if i had kept with those mm. mindsets mm, absolutely so does all of that, you know, being able to know that anything is possible, that transformational transformation is not only possible, but it's also important. Does that all of that feed into the life and the work that you find yourself doing now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, mm. that is the core of what's going on. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's the core of what, what I'm up to. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But again, like it's not it's not necessarily airy fairy either. The idea it doesn't have to be fantastical. Uh, shifts can be very subtle. It doesn't have to be like, um, for example, well, just it. It doesn't have to be. Look, I was this like shitty, stupid person, and now I'm this grand, wonderful person. Like it could just be a shift into openness, which is very subtle. You know, like mm. in the Vedas, which is again another. Um, uh, Indian teaching the idea is that when we start to gain CDs which are spiritual powers to try not to identify with them too much either so for example mm -hmm. I have psychic experiences quite regularly but I don't mm. identify as a psychic mm. you know what I mean so those types of, of um, or I do healing work where vibration and heat comes through my body and we create almost a container of uh, what can feel supernatural at times, but that doesn't mean that that's how I identify. That's just an experience that I have and something that happens with nature, you know? So I'm just trying to say that I guess that um, it doesn't have to be fantastical. We don't have to identify with something new in order to transform. Just that softness and that openness, I guess you could say, in itself is transformative by its very nature and, um, mm. and, it, and it exists as it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, all of this as well, it reminds me of um, a friend of mine back, because I used to live in, in London for many years, and there was this guy I knew, he, I think he still works for, um, you know, a major bank, he does IT stuff for this bank. But um, he's very, he's a definitely searching soul. And one of the things he used to speak about and it relates to what you and I have been discussing today is the idea that we all have these masks and he was very fascinated with the different masks that we wear in different situations. So he had his bank office job mask. He had the mask and by mask for those who might not um, be um, connecting with that term exactly by mask, it's meaning, you know, who, what part of yourself do you share? What part of yourself do you show in Persona. certain situations? Yeah, and we all have these different masks. And, and you know, there's something really powerful, you know, I can feel about the idea that it is possible to decide for yourself, for each and every one of us, what mask you would like to live with 
what mask you would like to show. Even coming into doing this today, of course, a part of me is like, I was thinking like, how should I show up? And then again, I have to actively with openness, not identify with anything in particular. Do you know what I mean? So I could come in this way. Hey, like I'm Josh, and I, you know what I mean, and that <laughs> place. But in this situation where we're talking about transformational openness, the goal is to uh, be conscientious of the fact that a mask might want to come up, and then continue to bring myself back to center and openness. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And, and don't get me wrong; if you're working at a bank or something, yeah, you got to have a mask, right? Because you're interacting with customers, and that's just a part of reality. It's just that. Um, yeah. It would be cool if, as a culture, we started to uh, move into more authentic or more open spaces within ourselves, in even mm. in those situations. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. You know, one thing as well that's striking me with all of this is um, how young you were when you began to make some of these really big realizations you know, and, and took action on them. So they became big transformations for you in your life. Um, you know, you, you touched upon it a little bit earlier when you said, you know, some of what you were realizing for yourself and, um, and how it shifted things for you. Some of those are things that, you know, for some people, they may not hit until they're closer to their forties, you know, maybe even later in life. Um, what for you, do you feel like allowed you to be able to come to those realizations so early? You mentioned your dad became a yoga teacher. Was that one of the, the... yeah, that, that helps for sure. Um, mm. I don't know. I think it might just be the Dharma or the karma of the situation though. You know, like when, when I tapped into the past life structure, again, there's been different uh, times and places where this work has been uh, very natural and important to me. So I think that it's just the Dharma of my life, you know, like, I don't think that I'm special and that it's happening because I, I, I'm somehow better or different than other people, but I do feel like this is just a part of my path. And I have met many others um, going forward who are quite young, who go through transformations like this as well. I've met quite, I mean, at this point, this is my job, right? So I spend a lot of time with people um, talking about these things. I'm finding there are lots of people that jump in early now. Um, at the time, I remember, uh, going through this, these transformations with a couple of friends like that, especially when I was 23, there was a couple more bumps and I was doing it with friends and we were all like, wow, I can't believe this is happening at this time. Like this is mm. such a big, unique thing, um, mm. uh, opportunity, I guess you could say, to go through these shifts in consciousness uh, at that youngness. I remember us kind of like being like, whoa, like this is crazy. I can't believe we're going through this right now. <laughs> But at the same time, yeah, I don't think that it's like necessarily a specialness or, or whatever. It's just, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. And I'm thinking mm. of my time, uh, because that potential energy or that openness, I guess, is very available to people right now if they choose to open to it. You mm. know, like there's, I don't know exactly why that is, but it just is, you know, some people talk about the Mayan calendar. There's so many explanations for the whole thing um, that are new age and, uh, and, and religious and there's all sorts of reasons that I could jump to but I try not to jump to the reason and just appreciate that it's it is happening as it is mm, but I would really give nice. if I know people are watching this specifically because they're interested in transformation I would mm. suggest that anybody can open up to these parts of themselves that are beyond their mask or beyond their uh, scripts like there is that silent part of the self it was the same when you were a child. It would be the same when you're 80 years old. There's a silent part of the self, an openness that already exists on the inside. Mm -hmm. So it's not about cultivating something new. It's about realizing what already exists, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Would another way to say that, um, would, would it also be accurate then to say that the core part of each of us so, you know, the people watching and listening, you, me, anyone, would the core part of our, I don't know, you could call it the essence that makes you you or your core desired beliefs or, you know, whatever, would it be accurate then also to say that that core part of you never really changes? That's, uh, there's a lot of teachings that say that that is the, 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 there's permanence and impermanence. The permanence part is that openness or that background soul or silence and the impermanence is everything else, which includes mm. our bodies, minds, experiences, perceptions, 
uh, that is the core teaching of most of those mystical traditions is that the, the permanency is the silence or the openness and the impermanence is everything else. Mm, I love that. I love that. So for you then, you've spoken a bit about how, you know, transformation and the idea of that, you know, anything is possible, that that has become, and it is a, an important part of the work that you do and how you help others. Where do you see yourself potentially going from here? That's a good question. It's funny, I'm in kind of a flux area in my life right now where um, mm. I'm not 100% sure as to where I'm going. I mm. feel like the energy of our time right now is very much on healing. There's a lot of wounding coming up. There's a lot of pain coming to the surface and many, many people. And so I think that right now my goal is just to hold space for that as best I possibly can. Um, in, in the future, I'd like to continue creating spaces, though, where that openness exists. Me and uh, five friends opened and maintained a spiritual center for two years uh, that ended mm. up and the goal, it was called The Center, and the goal was to have it be an open space so that people from all walks of life, without any particular religious or philosophical um, um, affiliations, basically, could come in and just be in that open space that we were talking about before. And, and it was mm. spoken of just like that. When people came in, they went, oh, wow, something just shifted. I feel a little bit different. I, I sense something a little more open inside myself. And that's the goal is to continue creating those spaces as much as possible and to be and hold that space within myself as much as possible. But I don't really have a, a future aspiration other than that. And to perhaps write books with, uh, with these same teachings in them or, um, or do these types of video conferences or whatever. I, I would like to continue doing that, but I don't have anything much more than that. <laughs> Recently, <laughs> I was able to come and do Reiki and meditation at uh, a couple of businesses and mm. that was really beautiful because businesses are the current accessible space I guess you could say in our culture mm. so being a person who is fairly anti-capitalist I'm not anti anything but I'm not particularly fond of our system mm. being able to go into those places where these things are happening and bring openness and bring a level of connection to the people that were working there was very, very fulfilling. So I would like to keep doing that for sure. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. You know, and just from my experience, um, I've worked in, I've had a very interesting path, but anyway, I'll share that another time. But from my, just the experience I've had in the private sector, um, you know, so businesses, corporate, the corporate world and so on, that's definitely what you're doing and sharing with people it absolutely is very needed. And there are loads of studies as well in research that show the, um, the, 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 the positive results and the importance of helping people on those, you know, sort of like holistic, um, some might may call it spiritual levels yeah. and actually how it helps overall. It, and it felt fulfilling coming out of it. What was interesting to me is that I don't think that I don't think that the people coming really knew what they were getting into, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> we're doing, we're, we were doing uh, again Reiki, which is a form of energy movement, and you know, at first through a conditioned mind, it's like, oh, like I'll be a healer or I'm doing this thing, but to go into the experience and exploration of consciousness the experience of exploration of that openness and to move energy in a, not a, a fantasy, but not in the mind, but in the actual physical reality. It was kind of cool to watch uh, people exploring the depths of their being all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. That they thought they were going to just like a regular old seminar or something. <laughs> <laughs> but they were touching on the deeper parts of self. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was cool. It was cool to see, to see people going through little transformations even in those moments. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. You know, as we, I feel like we could talk all day and I have loved this conversation. This feels so very powerful. And, you know, we've touched on some really deep topics, but in, you know, accessible ways for people. Um, as we wind this up though, there, there's a, a question I will ask and, um, 
yeah and i'll just ask it and i have a feeling that you know it may be something that can give a little bit of food for thought for those who are watching and listening and and i hope it's an interesting question for you as well as i ask it um when you think about your life journey so far so you know, thinking back to you know little josh as a little boy through to your teenage years you know early adult years and the person you are the person you're, you're continuing to become if you were able to share with the world or you know to to someone who is important for you one sort of um takeaway from you what would you like them to be left with what would be sort of um i don't know key message or what would you like them to know um well again that in behind your eyes will feel like there is a script or a thought form um, that is the character that we we think we are. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, if you keep going even further behind your eyes, you're going to find that part of the self that's connected um, in the deepest part of your being. And that the way to change the world, what Chris say, would be for many, many people to be connected into that deeper part of their being. Mm -hmm. And I hope beyond hope that that's where we're going and that we're going to start to build new systems or a culture based around those principles of being in openness um i know that it's possible to transform i know that it's possible to take the negative wounded experiences that we have on the inside and work with those as well finding healing and liberation in those spaces. And again, it's not necessarily a one shot deal. I'm still going through processes myself regularly, but that there, we're never totally stuck. We're never mm. totally lost. We're never totally stagnant. There is always an ability to keep growing and shifting and finding again that the deepest part of our being already exists. So when people talk about finding themselves, it's not an outward process, you know, it's good to explore different things in the outward world, but ultimately what we're looking for is what we already have and what we already are. Um, mm. That is a then teaching that I think is very important for our world right now, especially a world with so much information and opportunity. It's really important to remember that that's, that which we're seeking is already on the inside. Beautiful, beautiful. That feels like an amazing way to, to, close this and end this part for now. I love that. You know, if people are, who have been watching and listening um, and have heard what you do, heard about you, if they would like to connect with you and learn more about how they could receive help and support and more about what you do, how can they do that? That's a good question. I was working at a healing fair over the weekend and people kept saying, you must have business cards. And I went, oh, no, I don't even have those. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a particularly good, I'm getting better, but I'm not a particularly good business person. Um, <laughs> connecting with me over Facebook, which is Josh Coleman, um, email joshua.coleman at gmail.com. Probably that would be the best two ways to do it because I travel quite a bit. So I'll be uh, able to access the internet more than anything else. Um, mm. I th yeah, I'd say those would be the two ways to do that. And I do, again, one-to-one -one sessions where I just sit in openness with people. And I find when you hold that open space and when you're connected to your own being, that there's a resonance that happens and the person can tap into this quite easily. And and classes and, and workshops in businesses and that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you have any interest in, in having me come to do any of those things, I would absolutely love to. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much, Josh. This has been amazing, um, really inspirational, and so much, uh, so many incredible uh, topics and things that I, I know will be an inspiration for others. A lot of really great thoughts. Yeah, thank and, you so and, much. And for those who are watching this series, imagine there's going to be a lot of really wonderful speakers here. I happen to know a few of them personally, but I know that there's going to be a lot of wonderful speakers and a lot to, to, uh, to share from lots of different people. So thank you for doing this. Christa. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And you know, if you ever have any questions for myself or Josh, um, I'm going to make sure that our contact details and also the details that Josh mentioned here for how you can contact him, that they will be listed on the website as well underneath his name. So please do get in touch. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye for now. I'll live for the good days, I'll dream of the great nights, I'll live for the ones I've lost, slide this up, we gonna meet in the afterlife, it's all sacrifice, I got the appetite to be a better man, let's unite, my story like a motion picture.